All right, we're going to uh, wrap up our couple of days with the answers to everything. <laughs> Marine spatial planning, yay! Um, it was seriously, I, I, we did design this in discussions with the planning uh, committee to come to this conclusion because you can avoid issues of energy and the trade-offs that we're all talking about in these different venues uh, when you think about fisheries management. Uh, and you certainly can't avoid the term marine spatial planning and uh, the intersection of that process with fisheries management and the other existing management regimes out there in the ocean right now. So we've assembled this panel to kind of bring us from our, our historical look at the beginning of yesterday sort of up to the latest headlines today. Um, and we've got a great panel to help us do that. Uh, Dennis Nixon is our moderator. Um, he's also a member of my planning committee, member of my advisory board. What else do you do? I don't, I don't know. But Dennis, is, Dennis is around a lot, and we're very appreciative for uh, uh, our partnership with URI and uh, the joint degree program that we're able to offer our students. Um, he's been with URI since 1976, uh, the author of many articles, papers, reports, case books, um, and is also responsible uh, for administering all the operations of the research vessel Endeavor, uh, which operates out of URI. Uh, to his left is Don Migliori, uh, who's an attorney with Motley Rice, uh, and he is an extremely experienced litigator, uh, everything from asbestos to tobacco to 9-11. When I first approached Don about speaking on this, he said, well, I don't know anything about ocean stuff. I'm like, good, because we got that covered here. <laughs> we've got the ocean lawyer people here. But we've asked Don to be part of a, a, of a little reflection here on intersections of what I'm calling old energy, oil and gas. He's active in representing uh, fishermen down in the Gulf of Mexico at this point uh, and has a tremendous amount of experience to offer. To his left uh, is Dan Cohen, and Dan comes to us uh, from New Jersey. He's the principal and president of Fisherman's Energy, which is the new energy piece of the puzzle. It's a fisherman-owned offshore wind company. Um, he's also principal and president of Atlantic Cape Fisheries, an East Coast vertically integrated fishing company. Uh, he's really taken an interesting role in the whole offshore wind conversation. So he's going to offer that perspective. We're then going to shift for another perspective on offshore wind, I, I think. Uh, Dave Frula is a partner at Kelly, Dry, and Warner uh, down in their D.C. office. Um, and they're very active up here in representing fishing industry in all kinds of management and uh, regulatory matters. Uh, and he's employed now, well, his firm is employed in representing some fishermen that are involved in litigation relating to the Cape Wind offshore wind facility. To his left is Grover Fugate. Um, and Grover is the executive director of the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council. Recently completed just a little project that kept him a little bit busy for the last couple of years, and that's the Rhode Island Ocean SAMP. Um, and I'm not even going to describe it. I'll let you describe it, but I am going to make you stick to your time limit, Grover. So um, you can't describe it too much. Uh, but I've asked Grover to talk. Uh, th there aren't many, many managers who've actually done a marine spatial planning process. And we're pretty unique here in New England that we've had two states, not one, but two, that have actually undergone some sort of a comprehensive planning process. And so uh, I've asked Grover to, to talk about uh, the intersection of fisheries and the thinking uh, about that as in, in a, in a state-run uh, coastal marine spatial planning process. And finally, we're going to end up with, with Eric back again for more. Um, and uh, he's not going to talk about the catch-share policy. Uh, but I've asked him to offer the federal perspective on what this new world means with the executive order, uh, regional planning bodies, and the intersection of fisheries. So, Don, we'll let you lead it off here. Giving a lawyer 15 minutes is dangerous. Um, <laughs> I really did have that, that um, reaction. I wasn't quite sure what I could contribute. And then when I got here and started listening to the presentations, I was absolutely certain I didn't know what I could contribute. <laughs> um, I'm a lawyer. And uh, one of the things I enjoyed most about preparing for this was the, um, the, the cliches that I could, could throw at you. I, I, I got to tell you, when you have a disaster like what happened in the Gulf, um, it does attract a certain type of uh, fishing, and it's a fishing of plaintiff lawyers uh, for cases. And, and unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there who have um, truly gone out to try to figure out how to 
uh, represent the interests of people in a genuine way who were affected by what happened down on the Gulf. Um, but the, uh, the temptation for me to say things like sharks trolling in waters and things like that <laughs> was overwhelming. So if that happens, forgive me. I'm a product of my father, and, and he's got that kind of humor. Speaking of which, uh, my father and my four brothers are all doctors. So coming back from lunch, I will start with one. Uh, their favorite joke is, what's the difference between a catfish and a lawyer? One's a bottom-dwelling, scum-sucking scavenger. The other one's just a fish. <laughs> <coughs> My response to them is always, what's the difference between God and a surgeon? God never thought he was a surgeon. <laughs> All right. So lunch is digested. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I, I got involved with BP not because of any background I have in, in the fields that Everybody here has such impressive backgrounds in the area. I, I have no background at all. I have a boat that I don't use. Um, but I was lead counsel, I am lead counsel for all the victims of September 11th in the tragedy uh, that happened almost 10 years ago. And in that process, I got very involved in compensation issues for victims of terrible disasters. And uh, as a result, Ken Feinberg, the current special master or I forgot what title they've given him now, but the person who's running the BP fund and I have uh, wrestled and argued and agreed for years about what you do to compensate people who are affected. And um, when this BP event happened, Justice Department, of course, got involved right away and went to BP and said, we've got criminal issues, we've got civil issues, we've got um, damage issues, we need to sit down and talk. And one of the things that came out of that was a commitment by BP to put at least currently $20 billion aside, $5 billion every year for four years, to pay the victims of what happened down there. Um, how that money got paid out was a very debated, still is a very much a debated issue, and I serve on a committee. It's very much involved in trying to define for Ken Feinberg and others what would be a meaningful way to help the fishermen and others on the coast who were affected by the BP oil spill. And those negotiations are very contentious, and there is to be no confusion. While President Obama put Ken Feinberg in that position, Ken Feinberg is paid about a million dollars a month to buy BP to gather as many claims as possible and hopefully gather as many releases of claims as possible over the next several months so that the liability for what happened uh, in, in the Gulf is controlled. Um, I can't do a presentation without exploiting my daughter. And when I was told I was doing the first presentation after lunch on a Friday, I took advantage of this. But my daughter's 18 months old, and often I go to her for important advice. And uh, this was advice about the off season in baseball, now that the World Series has ended. And I asked her what she thought about our Red Sox and their prospects for next year. Gloria, what do you think of the Yankees? They <laughs> suck. So, there's nobody here from DCYF, is there? So the spill happens, people are injured, and now we've got to decide what we do. What do we do for these folks? Of course, the, the inju injuries go everywhere from the water to humans and lives lost. BP, of course, initially came out strong and said that this was something that they could not have foreseen. That is a dream for a person like me to disprove. Of course, it goes back, there are millions of examples, but going back even to 1979 in the same Gulf, very similar events, 10 months of, of, uh, of spill, and over 3 um, million barrels of water entering the Gulf. Uh, unlike the estimates, and, and I know that um, we have much more accomplished people uh, who've really studied this and actually the endeavor actually finding the plumes, um, who can give you better details of facts about what actually happened in the Gulf. But the, the idea of this not happening before being unforeseen is, uh, is ridiculous. Of course, in the Mexican uh, spill in 1979, 162 miles of U.S. beaches were affected. And, of course, those have implications for industries from fishing to um, the service industries. BP's uh, safety violations are legion. 
the um, blowout protectors that were involved in the BP uh, spill this year uh, had not actually fully been inspected and properly inspected since the year 2000. Uh, going back to 2000, BP has been cited for so many different violations uh, from uh, leaks and blowout systems to uh, falsifying inspections to uh, refinery explosions to American, uh, I'm sorry, Alaskan pipeline leaks. Um, so we certainly have plenty of information about BP and its uh, approach to its disasters. The role that BP played in trying to put this as a uh, forefront issue for the industry, though, is something that very much um, is a focus of the different types of litigation that resulted from uh, what happened in April. Um, the uh, testimony uh, from folks like the president of BP talking about uh, well, the importance of the blowout preventers uh, is very important. They talk about it as the key fail-safe system. Uh, there was reports, there were reports just two weeks before the event of leakage going on, nothing having been done. And also we, of course, have a treasure trove of comments from uh, Mr. Hayward. Why, what happened that, that uh, they should deserve something like this. Um, the whole issue, according to him, was the ultimate safety device, the blowout preventer failing. If it didn't fail, he said it would have been a very serious industrial accident, but we wouldn't be dealing with the spill. He said, but fortunately, 20 days after, 24 days after, it's such a big body of water that the volume of oil and dispersant we're putting into it is tiny, so it really won't be that big an effect. It's, on, it's only on the surface. There aren't any plumes. Of course, URI disproved that. And there's no evidence that oil was suspended in large masses beneath the surface. Meanwhile, we've got a 22-mile long, 6-mile wide, and more than 1,000 feet deep plume reported by the University of South Florida and other southeastern educational institutions and, of course, the University of Rhode Island. Um, there were predictions early out by BP that this was going to be a very modest effect on the environment. The Gulf of Mexico uh, response plan they were bragging about was four inches thick, therefore it must have been sufficient. Um, my favorite part about their response plan is that they were absolutely committed in their documents that they were going to protect all the walruses in the Gulf of Mexico, <laughs> which haven't lived there in three million years. Uh, so according to the testimony of at least U.S. Representative Markey, the only technology that, that he thought the oil company seemed to be relying on were the Xerox machines to put together the uh, response plans. Of course, when finally confronted with their history, con finally confronted with their uh, conduct or lack of uh, conduct, uh, the president of the company said, well, this wasn't our fault. This really was the fault of other companies. And it wasn't us, it was Halliburton, it was Transocean. And the blame game starts. So who is responsible? Well, of course, BP is there. And under the Oil Protection Act, BP would be the company that's responsible for paying out any claims that come out of it. And then there is a subsequent process under the OPA uh, legislation for them to go after who they think might be contributorily uh, involved or liable. And the um, primary players in that blame game would be BP, Transocean, and Halliburton. And of course, we all hope that Mr. Hayward gets his life back. Um, so the fun, the, the angles, the different ways to deal with the claims of my clients, the fishermen, the hotels, the condo owners, the uh, restaurants, uh, there are three basic options. One is the BP fund itself. The BP fund actually started by BP before Ken Feinberg was involved. And it had a very different life than it does right now. And I'll describe the differences a little later. The Oil Protection Act is something that basically came out of the uh, Exxon uh, experience. And it has plenty of limitations, but it's designed to streamline some of the claims processing of those affected by such a disaster. And of course, the plaintiff lawyers who convinced their clients that the right redress or these two other no-fault systems, that is, the BP fund and the OPA uh, claims process are no-fault systems. You don't have to any burden as a claimant to prove what happened or didn't happen or whose fault it is. Uh, you just have to prove your claim at some level, or, for the most part. 
but with the multi-district litigation, there are burdens involved. But for those folks who are looking for more than just the compensation component of, um, of redress, that is those folks who want to do the investigation of what actually happened, discover what happened, get some accountability, and maybe have some change involved or have some resulting change involved for the preventability of such acts, they file lawsuits throughout the country. And uh, there's something called the multi-district litigation panel, which assigns all those litigations from the different district courts, federal courts throughout the country to one judge. That recently happened, and it's before Judge Barbier in uh, New Orleans. And so that litigation, mostly on behalf of bigger commercial interests that wouldn't go through voluntary funds, uh, that litigation is moving forward as we speak. So BP set up a claim process right away, uh, and they committed that we'll talk to people, determine which documents they need, and we'll be in touch within four days and get them a check on the spot. Uh, we'll talk to people, determine what they need, and um, the reality is, is that the BP process didn't ever really set up and move out claims at all. In fact, many of the claimants that we had represented were telling them, we can't write you a check, we don't have any checks yet. Uh, this is two months after the disaster. These are fishermen who uh, don't necessarily have the uh, savings accounts uh, to uh, live for months without income or without a, a livelihood. And um, that time was very, very critical. And of course, there's some issues about how you prove how much money you've lost. Um, some folks in the fishing industry aren't necessarily very good at accounting or keeping records for tax purposes. Proving a claim up with a tax record is a very serious issue. And it's a claim issue that is involved in any kind of lawsuit. But when BP set up its claims facilities, they made sure that they had police officers surrounding the facility constantly. And um, in some people's perspective, it was a, an intimidation um, uh, tactic. Whether that's true or not, or not, the BP fund, as administered by BP itself, was not effective. It got very little money out the door. Uh, and it had to be dealt with directly by um, this fund created with the imprimatur of the um, approval of the President of the United States. And Ken Feinberg was put in place. Since that happened, the fund now has moved out. My role in working with the fund was to help negotiate some of the protocol for emergency payments, that is, what types of proofs were needed, what kinds of claims would be given, what kind of offsets would be taken against a claim. And these are some of the details as of a few days ago, anyway, um, the fund's payment and success since Ken Feinberg got involved. Uh, Ken Feinberg initially anticipated that there'd be a total number of claims of 250,000. That is, throughout the entire process, once he opened his doors to claims processes, over 300,000 claims got filed. Of those, 89,000 had been approved, and they break down in various ways, but essentially the claims are either made by individuals or businesses for their loss. Okay. The um, emergency payments range in different types of values, but essentially there are removal cleanup costs. None of those have been paid injury to real property or personal property, some of those are being paid. Far and away, the biggest number of emergency payments made to date are in the form of losses to businesses and individuals, and most of those you'll see are in the range of zero to $25,000 if you're an individual, or zero to $100,000 if you're a business. But the um, types of folks who are making those claims, first of all, from the states, Louisiana so far has the largest number of claims filed. A little surprisingly, Florida has the next highest uh, in that the uh, spill took the longest to get to Florida. Um, but uh, you'll see from there, it then goes on Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, and others. Of the individual claims, fishing actually wasn't the largest um, uh, basis or, or approved claim uh, amounts paid out. Uh, it really was the service industry on an individual basis. Those people who worked in restaurants and hotels and, and things of the like. Um, but if you get into the business loss earnings, fishing at that point, the, the largest number of claims paid by far on a business level were to the fishing industry. And that constituted about $332 um, million. And the total payout to date by this fund is about $1.5 billion. But if you add up the individual and business, you're talking about a half a billion dollars so far just in emergency payments uh, going out to uh, the fishing industry. What does that mean? That means we've got a lot of claims coming. This is just the iner initial phase. An emergency payment does not 
generate a release of your claim. Uh, the emergency payment only uh, gets you by, theoretically, for a month or six months. And the net effect of that is that we're going to get lots and lots of more claims, and the amounts are going to go higher. The, the fund is completely voluntary by BP. Uh, they can stop payment at any time. In fact, they threatened to do so very recently, and as a result, the Obama administration lifted the moratorium on drilling in the Gulf uh, early, a month early so that BP could, and others could start their drilling um, now. Uh, so we anticipate that the fund will require a lot more than $20 billion in the end. So is it any safer? Is there anything we can learn from this? Is there anything that we should be doing on a policy side? I'm just a plaintiff's lawyer. Um, I hope you all who are much smarter than me and have studied this help us find an answer. But it, this does affect real human beings, businesses, family businesses, and uh, a culture down in the Gulf that um, hopefully we can do something about. Thank you very much. My name is Dan Cohen. I'm a principal of Fisherman's Energy and also Atlantic Cape Fisheries. Uh, I'm going to try to do this relatively quickly. I have a lot of slides, but I'm going to try to speak as quickly as I can. Be in my 15 minutes and give me a few minutes warning because I'm going to drop right to the end where I have slides specifically for this group here. Um, I want to say that the whole purpose of this, and I think about this, has a lot to do with the nexus between commercial fishing and other uses. Um, it's really a question of you know, the nexus between fish and energy. Um, I would like to quote someone who spoke at a different conference uh, in California where I spoke, which really is the reason why we have such big problems with uh, trying to resolve these issues is really how do we want to save a fish and really we, need a, we should all wear condoms. To uh, be clear is that the problem we have with all of our problems here is that of a growing population putting demands on limited resources. And if we could somehow try to get balance in that, that's really you know, the policy issues we're all dealing with is how to po balance you know, growing population and growing needs with a limited resource. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, a, a paradigm shift between, uh, led by myself and other people in the fishing industry, having to do with offshore wind. I'm going to kind of give you a background on who we are. I'm going to give you a history of how I, I developed, where, where we are today, and what we think the implications are for policy and questions for you about policy. Um, to be clear, uh, we're a, a, a um, community-based, by community-based I'm saying we're owned, all the equity and all the money so far in Fisherman's Energy has come from myself and people like myself, you'll see that in a minute. Um, we initially were opposed to wind. It was first proposed in 2003 in New Jersey. Uh, it was first proposed up here in 2001 by Jim Gordon. We can talk about that in a little bit. We were initially opposed, but um, over time, and you'll see that we uh, basically decided that we could either be victims of change or agents of change because we decided quickly that the decision to build offshore wind would be a societal decision or not, and if society wanted it, it would happen whether or not we were opposed or not. And as we began to look at our competitors and what they brought to solving the puzzle, we came to the conclusion that we had lots of things to bring to this picture that they didn't have. We didn't look like real estate developers. We actually had employees, waterfront properties, um, people who were capped in terms of their effort, who were looking to take their skill set and change it. We had built successful businesses, and you'll see that. Um, nope, we'll go back one real quickly. Why offshore wind? Why fishermen's energy? It's because where we work. Why offshore wind? It's primarily because society is looking for a renewable energy. If you look at all the federal and state studies for the east coast of the United States, we don't have alternatives. We don't have onshore wind. We don't have untapped rivers. Um, all the studies st say that if we need renewable energy, um, which I think we can all probably come to the conclusion that we do, um, that the only real options for dense off, um, energy comes from offshore energy, offshore wind. In terms of our businesses, we actually go to fish to fish, go to sea to fish, but we're actually fishing for dollars. Um, who are the people who propose this and are involved in the company? There are principals of um, East Coast fishing companies who invested individually with me. Um, so between us, we own over 100 vessels. Uh, between us, we have uh, locations and facilities in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, and we're basically trying to develop a business that will be built side by side with our existing fishing businesses. 
Um, you know, part of this comes to a, looking at a different paradigm because I would like to be clear that um, offshore wind um, and offshore energy development will have significant long-term cumulative impacts, which I'd like to talk about near the end. Um, and one of the things that we've tried to do is put together a paradigm that would say how could we do it differently, one, trying to use smart siting uh, uh, techniques to try to site them in a manner that would have minimal impact or at least reduce the impact, enable investment by the industry itself, enable retraining for people within the industry, um, continue to work with fisheries management and with fishery science, which all of us do ex extensively, and also develop a paradigm of saying that we would mitigate and expect other people to mitigate um, long-term negative impacts, which is something that other developers aren't talking about and we'd like to see adopted. Um, to be clear, how can a bunch of dumb fishermen do this? We can only do this if we can build a world-class team, um, and we've done that, and I'll explain the competitive environment we're involved in, but without going through the, through our, the people who are working with us, and we have many more than this at this point, but um, we, we've brought on board, example, just uh, Amec, which is our lead engineers, um, are the 12th largest engineering firm in the world. They're from London, they have, though they have 6,000 employees in North America. They designed the first offshore wind farm in England. They're doing two 500 megawatt wind farms for Centrica, the largest utility in England. Um, and without going through our, our team players, I can say that example, our COO is the previous COO of uh, Con Edison unregulated development company did 7,000 um, 7, megawatts of development. What started the process, I'm going to try to go through, I'll just go this quickly. Again, in 2003, the state of New Jersey did a study looking for renewable energy and came to the conclusion that the only real resource was offshore wind. Um, when it was proposed, New Jersey's fishing industry, along with American Littoral Society, New Jersey Audubon opposed it. Uh, therefore, the governor put a moratorium on offshore wind in 2004, appointed a blue ribbon panel. That blue ribbon panel reported back to the new governor in 2006 saying that in reality, we don't know, don't know the impacts on birds, whales, dolphins, or fishermen, but we do need renewable energy. Let's build at least one wind farm. It'll be a pilot. We'll do environmental monitoring and we'll know what the impacts are. During this same period of time, I led an effort amongst the fishing industry of New Jersey to say, should we continue to be opposed or not? We quietly formed a company. We started adding to our team. We decided not to be public because we wanted to first determine whether we could actually do this. And again, part of this, most people don't recognize the scale of development, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you know, there's two parts of developing offshore wind and two parts of the environmental community. There's one part of the environmental community that now uh, fairly is clear that you know, global warming is a reality and that would like to see offshore energy developed as quickly as possible. There's another part of the environmental community that says we have to do it, but in a manner that's consistent with birds, whales, and dolphins to make sure our impacts are mitigated. Um, part of the Blue Room Panel recommended an uh, environmental baseline, uh, similar to the ocean stamp process you'll hear about. The state of New Jersey began studies in 2008, did 23 months of studies for birds, whales, and dolphins in an area 72 miles long and 20 miles wide and that um, has now been concluded where the, where the at least initial projections are the impacts would be de minimis, especially for our first project. Um, what have we done? In October of 2007, the state solicited a private developer to, to build a, or propose to build a pilot wind farm. Uh, that, those uh, proposals were due on March 3rd, 2008, so now about a little more than two and a half years ago, we became first publicly known when we submitted a competitive proposal. There were five proposals submitted. And um, we submitted a unique proposal, which has really changed New Jersey's policies, and I think will over time change federal policies. Uh, everyone proposed large-scale 350 megawatt projects offshore in federal waters. To put this in context, the 350 megawatt wind farm in federal waters will cost about $1.4 billion. We quickly realized that um, none of this made sense. Number one is in 2007, when it was first solicited, the largest offshore wind farm in the world was Horns Rev, it was only 160 megawatts. So the idea that you would build a pilot to be twice as big as the largest in the world made no sense. We knew no one would be financing us for one and a half billion dollars, let alone anyone else. We were the only company that's proposed a two-phase solution, a project in state waters, which would be controlled. And again, part of this has to go with the regulatory environment. Uh, am I, I'll go faster, we're doing okay? Okay, um, the, the regulatory environment in federal waters is controlled by MMS. Uh, we proposed a small project in state waters, six turbines, it will be about $160, $180 million project, and we are very far along. Uh, our, we're, uh, well, where we're at right now is um, we have potential to build, we believe, not only the first offshore wind farm off of New Jersey, but actually the first in the country, and we'll talk to you more about that. 
But to be clear, no one will ever build offshore wind without someone paying for it. You can't do it without societal choices um, because, quite frankly, it is a societal hedge in terms of, A, the cost of energy, and two is the environmental benefits from removing fossil fuels from your generation source or replacing fossil fuels. Um, it, uh, there are not federal policies. I would tell you now because of what's happened in the most recent election, I don't project there'll be federal policies. It'll be clear for a while. It'll only happen initially with state policies. Uh, we, we pioneered in the state of New Jersey the first legislation. It was, uh, we helped write it. It was passed in June. It was signed by the governor in August. Um, and it delineates a pathway for 1,100 megawatts of offshore wind. And it identifies specifically our, our state water inshore project as a demonstration project. And it, it, um, this gives you an idea of what we're proposing off Atlantic City, six turbines directly off Atlantic City. Um, most people up here in New England always ask about public support. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, this is very different. I think it's a different time frame now than 2001 when Jim Gordon first proposed, and it's also um, a different uh, environment here off of New Jersey. Uh, we commissioned uh, public opinion polling with our local university or college. They used Zogby. We did visualizations. You can't see them very well, but there are turbines in the, in, they're off of the Atlantic City boardwalk. The surveys were done in the month of July, separating tourists from um, locals. And you'll see that both tourists and locals, both from Margate, Brigantine, Atlantic City, all the local communities had overwhelming support. One of the most interesting questions was, uh, if you were a tourist, would you come back if this was built? The vast majority of people were coming for casino gambling and go to the beach. They didn't care. But 4% would, would come back less often. 19% would come back more often. So that you know, from the community's point of view, from the business center's community point of view, not only would we be producing renewable energy, we'd be creating tourism. Um, in part because of this, we have significant support from the city of Atlantic City, where they're hoping to rebrand themselves as the birth, birthplace of offshore wind in the country. Um, to be clear, part of what we need to do is apply for permits. We're in our permitting phase now. Um, we're pretty far along in our permitting phase with both the Army Corps of Engineers and with the state of New Jersey and currently in consultation with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and nymphs NOAA concerning both birds, whales, dolphins, fish, etc. As part of our program, one, we are doing environmental monitoring. We launched our first buoy on April 29th. Um, we've begun pre-construction monitoring where we've, in addition to the 23 months of studies, we've committed to a minimum of one year pre-construction. It looks like it'll be probably closer to two, but one year pre-construction and then two years post-construction studies to look at the impacts on whales, birds, dolphins, fish, and fishermen. We began uh, uh, May 1st doing transect surveys weekly, looking, at, looking for the presence of species. Uh, our acoustic monitoring will begin in December, which then will continue then for at least three years for whales and dolphins. We've put up avian radar on the, um, that'll now, that'll, uh, off the steel pier that's going out over our site. Um, you might, if you read in the press, you'll be seeing the, about this, this Atlantic Sea in the background. We just performed all of our geotechnical and geophysical investigations. Uh, we are deploying the first in the world commercial application of a floating LIDAR, vertical LIDAR for wind assessment. It's the first commercial application in the world of this. We're using Lockheed Martin, the first application of uh, other technology. We'll go quickly here. Just to give you context, that's our state water project, which we hope to build in 2000, be operating in 2012. Um, in our federal water project, this is uh, me in 2000, when I had more hair, in 2009 receiving the first interim leases from Ken Salazar and the governor uh, for offshore interim leases. To give you a, two minutes, okay, so we're there. Was, so uh, basically, this is kind of a context, but really what's gonna be happening cumulatively and the things that will be interesting that group here, uh, the, get beyond this, what our long-term plans are. So what is the cumulative impact of offshore wind farms? So first you have New Jersey's goal of 3,000 megawatts. There'll be at least 150 square miles of turbines, at least 600 to 1,000 turbines by the year 2020. You know, clearly, the foundations will become an artificial reef, so there'll be an improvement for someone, but there'll be clearly negative impacts in terms of the ability of, rec um, of mobile gear fishermen, who are probably 99% of our fisheries in New Jersey, to operate around them. But it's bigger than that. You know, what is the cumulative impact of offshore wind farms? You might have read that Google is proposing with two other companies to build a uh, transmission backbone that'll go from actually it'll go beyond New York, but from New York all the way down to Virginia. They're talking about 6,000 megawatts of transmission capability. Again, you can see them visualizing six wind farms there. But let's talk about the stiloscope. And again, that 6,000 megawatts would be about 1,500 turbines. Um, but if you think about what the public goals currently are, 
One in the United Kingdom, 40% of electricity um, in England are talking about being produced by um, offshore wind, that'd be 9,000 turbines. And the recent DOE government report talks about 54 gigawatts of offshore wind off of the east coast of New Jersey, uh, of the United States, that'd be 10,000 turbines. So what are the cumulative impacts of such a thing? How will we decide about who builds these backbones and where? And do we have other options, or are these our only options for renewable energy? Um, part of your, your, the things that you've been talking about yesterday and today are the Magnuson Act, MMPA, ESA, MPA. So I'm going to give you some comments of that in relationship to offshore wind and fishing. I mean, I think all of these are societal choices and values enacted by Congress. Each act of Congress was imbued by a special interest or focus driven by specific perceived public values, such as fish, fishermen, EFH, mammals. But none of them are prioritized. So part of the whole problem we have with this whole process is that there's no prioritization as to which value is in, in what order we value these things. Um, and that, in my mind, is one of the biggest problems why fisheries management and the other uses are going to be stymied, because we don't really have a, a slide rule how to make these societal choices. I mean, an example of that is you have, uh, just an example here in terms of um, fisheries management plans focus. You know, a lot of the focus we talk about today all talks about how communities look, um, and very little discussion about energy. And yet here we have one department of the uh, government, DOE, saying we're going to build 10,000 structures potentially offshore, and at the same time we're managing fisheries to be inefficient. And a good example from my point of view is just you know, last week the New England Council voted against leasing of days at sea and trips and scalp fishery, imposing continued inefficiencies where we're going to waste the resource, waste paint, fuel, et cetera. Um, so how, you know, how do we you know, weigh these computing uh, public values? You have ocean zoning and marine spatial planning, the ecosystem management. Uh, the next, well, later on, Eric will speak about the presidential order. My own belief is that this presidential order is the end product of three groups, many of which are represented here, speaking past each other. Those are commercial fishing interests who basically were opposed to ocean zoning because what, why? Because we perceive, as a, and again, I'm, I own fishing vessels, the fishing industry perceives that ocean zoning will basically only has one choice, to zone you out of something you're doing now without any compensation and without any real mitigating factor. So in that respect, and two is, is that commercial fishing at a certain level has opposed ecosystem management, not because they don't believe that it might not be a good thing, but that we perceive that the public is one believing that, o that ecosystem management can work, but in fact, the public is not funding science, and if you not, don't fund good science, how can you actually make good decisions? So it would be poor to support some, a, a structure that doesn't have the tools. So here you have the fishing industry opposed. Then you have offshore wind industry, which opposed ocean zoning because, I'm, I'm almost done, right? Okay, this is my last slide. Um, I just wanted to say that, you, uh, again, the same thing where, where they saw a federal policy driven by MMS, Congress saying that they would write rules in 18 months. It took the MMS 44 months to write the rules and still has not implemented a way of permitting offshore wind farms. So they're now talking that it will take longer to permit an offshore wind farm than it will a nuclear power plant. Doesn't make a lot of sense, or coal plant. And then you have the environmental community that I believe that had the opportunity to forge some sort of partnership with these other groups and basically saw that they won an election and therefore they could do this through an executive order, but in reality are creating something that has no fundamental legislative background, no regulatory background, and therefore how it will actually operate. In reality, I see actually a, a less and less efficient system without well-defined goals and people not really working with a common purpose. Um, so these are just questions, what will things look like? How will people make decisions? Are there legislative fixes? Is there a way to somehow combine these things more efficiently? I don't know. But I would say as both a user of this, both from the fishing industry and from trying to achieve public goals, I'd say the public is doing a poor job of expressing itself. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm David Frula from Kelly Dry. Um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'd first like to thank Don for having me come all the way up here to be reminded that the Yankees suck. I get that at home. Um, but let me tell you where it leads, uh, because I went to church. Our kids go to, went to preschool at our church, and I, and I walked in one day when my son was four, 
And one of our friends walked up to me and said, Buddy learned, learned something really interesting. He learned the Yankees suck, and he learned it from your son. I said, oh, great. Um, who learned it at a Baltimore Orioles-Milwaukee Brewers game because the Orioles fans couldn't figure out who the hell they were playing against, so they were just saying <laughs> Yankees suck. <laughs> so just you wait. Just you wait. Well, I got other film, too. Uh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> A-Rod's a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know, and, and you guys are, you, you know, and, and I, we figured, I was told, Peter Shelley told me I better inject some levity into this in a hurry, given that it's Friday afternoon. Um, so I tried to. Uh, we do, we represent the, the fishermen of Martha's Vineyard um, in connection with the, the, the Cape Wind project. We filed suit in federal court in Washington, D.C. It's real simple. Um, from our perspective, and what it says in the complaint is, is that the, our clients don't oppose offshore wind. In fact, they support renewable energy. They just don't support a bunch of a whole wind farm on their historic fishing grounds. It's, it's, for them, it's as simple as that. Um, what I wanted to do was just spend a little bit of time first talking about um, some laws that have over the years, going all the way back to colonial days, recognized um, fishing um, and its value. Spend just a little bit of time talking about the president's executive order, uh, and I will try to be respectful of your time as well. Um, just a couple of laws. Uh, the, the first is the public trust doctrine, which uh, it dates from Roman times, and it creates a public trust for essentially the, the tide lands. Back then, three miles out was a long way, so the intertidal zone, um, mean low to mean high, and then out as far as the Romans could, could row, I guess. Uh, that's since changed. Um, what became interesting here in the U.S. is Massachusetts was a, was a state that actually gave development rights to folks to build wharves and piers um, in, on the, the mean low to mean high zone. Uh, so normally that's, that's a, a public trust land. Uh, Massachusetts is a little bit different, uh, but there is something called the colonial ordinances, uh, which I think is where I'm going to get to with this, which recognizes a priority use for fishing, fouling, and navigation um, in the intertidal zone and out. Uh, my colleague Drew Minkavich, who many of you know, uh, the best way to describe the colonial ordinance is whenever he went surfing um, and he wanted to walk across somebody's beach in Massachusetts, he'd always, he'd always bring his surf casting fishing rod. And they said, well, what the hell, you can't walk across my land to surf? He's like, but, yeah, but I got a fishing pole. So they're, they're priority, priority rights for fishing. Um, the Outer Continental La Shelf Lands Act, um, which is where the permitting process occurs for uh, the, the, uh, the, the wind energy projects, and again, I hope that Dan Cohen's presence here and what he, to what he talked about dis may dispel in his, in his investors some of your preconceived notions about fishermen uh, to the extent that you think that they're living in the 18th century. A lot of them are not. Uh, many of them are not. Most of them, in fact. Uh, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, um, from the start, explained that, that these kinds of uh, Permitting operations on the Outer Continental Shelf is not to affect the right of to navigation and fishing. Um, the, our, our lawsuit uh, relating to um, the Cape Wind project, um, there's another provision in the law which talks about e leasing and easements um, n not preventing interference with reasonable uses as determined by the Secretary. Uh, the question is whether fishing is generally considered a reasonable use. Uh, again, there's this notion of, of, of fishing um, as a reasonable use. NEPA will preserve cultural and historic uh, aspects of our heritage and promote wherever possible individual choice. Um, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, uh, when you're designating sanctuaries, that too uh, looks to commercial and recreational fishing both. Um, Magnuson, for its part, I'm sure you guys have talked Magnuson to death uh, yesterday. But again, there's the recognition of the value of fishing, both in terms of the food production and as an economic engine in coastal communities. There's also, uh, and this is maybe a larger point here, a council process where fisheries management policy is set. Where do you get to with uh, coastal and marine spatial planning and the president's executive order? Uh, it creates a second process um, 
next to the council process, which is what Dan alluded to, uh, where ocean planning is going to occur. Um, there are seven national goals and 12 guiding principles. In some places, they conflict with, with the Magnuson Act's 10 national standards. It adds new players uh, in the debate about how, in the deliberation process, about how the ocean is being used, and a whole boatload of new regulatory agencies. Um, again, finally, that another point that, that we made, comments we made um, in connection with the comments on, on the, the, what, what ended up being the, the president's executive order, is that it, it, this spatial planning process has the potential, if not the actuality, of taking regulatory authority away from each of these separate agencies that regulate offshore. Their authority is statutory. Um, the Magnuson statutory, Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act is statutory. There's this over layer now uh, done by executive order. How that all lives together, I think, remains to be seen. You, can see, you will see that the, the two regulatory processes uh, between a fishery <coughs> management plan um, and a coastal marine spatial planning process is, is very similar. Uh, to sort of step back for a minute, you know, what, what do I think about it? Um, I'm really sort of ragingly ambivalent about the marine spatial planning process, bluntly. Uh, on one hand, I agree completely with Dan Cohen that if you're out on the ocean and you're fishing, zoning can only be bad because it can only mean you can't go someplace you used to go. Uh, I, I think somebody mentioned to me somebody talking about putting fishermen in a box and what a great thing that would be. Uh, so that's, that's one side of it. The other side is, um, and, and my, my last slide is, well, what if, you know, Google wants to run a whole long, you know, basically lead cord down the ocean along the East Coast? And how do fishermen fight Google? Um, you know, frankly, in many respects, how do fishermen deal with, with, with the Jim Gordons of the world? Uh, it's, at some point, you, maybe you want a referee, maybe you want a negotiated process. But the thing to think about from the fishermen's perspective is most of them get tapped out just dealing in the council process. That's getting so complicated. So how do you create a system um, where fishermen, again, one of the historic users of, of, of the, the marine resources can, can compete effectively against all these other, you know, we create stakeholders. And, you know, even seaweed farmers become stakeholders. Um, not that there's anything wrong with seaweed farmers, but it just, it expands dramatically uh, what, what, what needs to be dealt with. Um, again, I, I, again the, the, the processes are very similar uh, between the, the coastal and marine spatial planning and Magnus, and I've just laid that out. Not, a, not a really a reason to spend a lot of time with that. Um, the, the, some of the national goals and guiding principles are different and I think are, are worthy of emphasis. I'm sure you, you've spoken through the, the Magnuson standards, um, but what's a little different when you look at um, the coastal marine spatial planning standards, I think you do see the influence of the environmental community fairly substantially. Um, no matter how many times Magnuson's been reauthorized, the words precautionary approach never make it in there, uh, but it makes it into the um, executive order. Although the way precautionary the precautionary approach is, is often used and the way it's described are a little different because what the actual terms are or the principle from the Rio Declaration is when there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. The notion of cost-effectiveness often gets lost, but that's part of it. That's part of it if it can be cabined to something that, that does look at the costs on historic use, uh, maybe that's a good thing. Reducing user conflict, um, again, that's, that's a, again, I understand. Uh, Ecosystem-based management, I think Dan Cohen, again, raised, raised a great point. Uh, ecosystem management done right is an incredibly data-hungry exercise. Uh, to be done as an empirically driven model, you need to know I mean, for instance, out, out, how much do whales eat? I mean, does anybody really know? I mean, it, it's that kind of thing. How, how much do uh, striped bass eat? Um, does, should, what do we do? How many fish are, you know, will you collect around a, a wind turbine? I mean, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of places where you're making a lot of guesses. Sometimes they're well-educated. Sometimes they're quite poorly educated and policy-driven. 
Uh, again, streamlining regulatory process, I question whether that's going to happen. Um, again, the, the notion of reducing conflict among old and emerging uses is, is something that, I, I guess, frankly, it has to happen in some context. Uh, the, the question is, how, how does that work in, a, in an efficient, cost-effective, and fair way? Um, the final point of these, these goals and principles is to uphold federal and state laws, regulations, and executive orders. Uh, I, there, there's one thing I think that's worth noting in the President's um, executive order that, that, that I, I haven't figured out how to reconcile, and again, this is something that, that, that we focused on. When, when you read agency responsibilities under the executive order, it says all executive departments, agencies, et cetera, et cetera, that are members of the Council, um, to the fullest extent consistent with applicable law, um, shall take as necessary to implement the policy set forth and the stewardship principles, participate in the process, and they shall, essentially shall, uh, do what the, these planning processes, and I, and I promise, I, I apologize, I truncated this so much I made it unintelligible and trying to go fast. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is it says the agency shall implement um, the, the, the goals of the marine, these marine spatial planning um, regional processes. But when you go to Section 9 and the general, print, the general provisions, and I, and I will read this a little more slowly. Uh, Nothing in this order implement the establishment of the council and the final recommendations shall be construed to impair or otherwise affect authority granted by law to an executive department or agency or the head thereof. How, how does that, again, the, where that gets interesting to me is you have a fishery management plan, you have an amendment, uh, that goes through the council process. Um, the Secretary of Commerce decides that those, uh, the council recommendations are consistent with the law, regulations are drafted, and it's implemented. Um, that's what the law tells the Secretary of Commerce to do, to go ahead and implement the council's recommendations if it's consistent with the law. Uh, I don't know where the overlay comes in if all of a sudden a marine spatial planning process says, well, you need to close to fishing the area where Google's got its lead cord. How, how does that, how's that all going to fit together? Um, again, on one hand, you're supposed, to, the, the agencies are supposed to do this. On the other hand, um, they're not supposed to do something that conflicts with, with the legal requirements. I think one of our concerns is that nobody's really thought this through yet, how that's all going to work together. Uh, again, the changes in players, just for your consideration, again, I, I just remember seaweed farming because it was on the top. Um, these are some of the, 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 the entities that are uh, stated to have interests um, in the tidal zones and out um, onto the Outer Continental Shelf to the end of the EEZ. Uh, no question everybody has an interest, no question that there's economic and aesthetic interests that all these groups hold, but there are a heck of a lot more of them that are going to get pulled into this, the spatial planning process. Again, it may be for the good because it may be that these processes are the referees, but that's, that's for the fishermen, that's daunting. Okay, Ch I'm, I'm real close. Uh, changes in regulators, all these different agencies, plus a partridge and a pear tree, are now involved in the National Ocean Council. Um, that's what's in red is the folks that are generally involved in fishery management. How will the fishermen be affected? Number one, Hakuna Matata, everybody wins, this all works. Uh, fishermen don't fish where the wind turbines are. We know that that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, number two, and what nobody's told me yet, because somebody put these, got these pictures for me, is whether that's the same set of turbines just from a different perspective, um, or whether it's, it's a different set of turbines. But again, you may have user conflicts. Uh, again, it's, it's pretty much what I've said from here is, is self-explanatory. It's what I've been talking about. And again, finally, can fishermen compete with Google? That is a tough road. Thank you. <laughs> You're the referee, man. Everybody has Okay. Um, I was asked to talk about MSP and the fishery. 
Um, and I, I think the previous two speakers have highlighted a lot of the issues that we need to look at and deal with. Uh, but certainly one of the, the, the major issues I think facing us, particularly here on the East Coast, is there are uh, this emerging use, particularly in the energy field, that is coming on very strong. And when you look at the issue itself, I mean, uh, this is out of NREL, 78% of the electricity that's consumed in the U.S. Is, is actually consumed by 28 coastal states. So there's very much a coastal issue. Um, and if we're going to address that, it needs to be addressed at the coastline. And the other issue is, is that, as already been pointed out, we have a very uh, prolific resource at the coastline for generating electrical energy. And if you look at DOE's projections, in fact, for wind energy, uh, you're going to see that obviously we're right here, but they're projecting by 2030 that we're going to have about 30% of our, I mean, 20% of our uh, energy generated by offshore wind. And what that means, and these are actual proposed projects here that are uh, along the East Coast, is that there's going to be a proliferation of these projects. Uh, starting up uh, in the offshore environment. And as already been alluded to, Google is moving into this too, which is going to accelerate the whole development of this process. If you look at worldwide, this is the current inshore off capacity uh, for wind energy. And you're going to see that the United Kingdom is a major player. Look at Germany and watch what happens at the projection by 2015. The United Kingdom becomes a minor player, really, in, in essence, next to Germany. And there are many others that are coming on stream. Offshore wind is here to stay, and it's going to grow uh, at a very rapid pace uh, because it is utility-grade renewable energy, and there are very few that can claim that at this point. And the technologies are evolving. Uh, we already have monopile. We're now moving into jacketed systems, gravity-based systems. Uh, these tripods, and in the development phase is the floating production systems, which will move us even further offshore. So, one of the major problems that we have as a MSP exercise uh, is, by definition, marine spatial planning is a spatial exercise, but the fishery data, for instance, in trying to understand what the resource is itself and the fishermen that use it, is that the data is not really in an appropriate scale or form. Uh, these are the statistical blocks, for instance, that you see for fishery management purposes to bring it down to our scale. This is Rhode Island. And so this is the statistical block. These are not useful at all uh, in terms of trying to then integrate these new uses, these offshore wind energy, uh, because you can't tell uh, what the impacts are going to be to the resorts from these types of exercise and gathering data. This is a, for instance, a habitat ish, a map that was produced. And again, the scale is very coarse here. This is not useful to us when we're going to look at it. These are the types of maps that we generate for habitat when we're looking at trying to get to this information uh, for siting decisions. So this uh, information as is currently gathered is not very useful to us. And there are a host of legal issues also uh, associated with getting access to this uh, information. In the Ocean Samp, we actually went 30 miles offshore. Um, we did that because AC transmission has a practical limit of about 20 miles, and we wanted to provide a 10-mile overlap on the data set. We went forward, and as already been pointed out, uh, this is an expensive process. The Ocean Samp, by the time we get through with it, will have generated uh, and collected about $10 million worth of data. Uh, in this area. So, uh, and uh, although it is a very large area, 30 miles offshore, uh, we still had to get very smart about how we were focusing and spending our money in this area. We couldn't collect all the data for everything over this area. Regarding fisheries, um, we wanted to look at the ocean space. We wanted to manage the existing resources and provide uh, protection for those existing resources within these areas. And we wanted to summarize the best available data that we had trying to understand the resource itself and also the fishing activity. As part of this, we composed what we called a Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC, uh, and this, uh, these are the groups that actually participated in the TAC in verifying the information that we uh, generated to make sure that we were technically accurate when we went through to depict the information 
Uh, all these groups were fed the chapter and chapters as we we're going through looking at this um, from a fishery perspective to make sure that our information was correct. The chapter objectives themselves uh, were to, one, obviously provide a baseline of data so that we could understand, again, what the resource is, what the uses were. We also wanted to highlight that this was a very important industry to the state. Uh, and that becomes important when we start to move into federal consistency uh, and the use of federal consistency for um, exercising greater state control in these areas. And then uh, we wanted to outline policies or regulations that might be protective of the industry itself. The chapter methodology was we were to gather essentially all the data that we could, review any reference documents, uh, the literature, the data, and then analyze that, and then review that, send that back out to the TAC to make sure that our analysis was correct. Some of the data that we actually started to amass is, you can see this is aggregate biomass, um, the size of the circles are relating obviously to the biomass, and then there are various uh, sampling entities that have done the collection that are depicted here. Also, uh, what we started to do is we did an exercise that was uh, fairly new. Uh, we collected these VTRs on one minute squares, uh, the VTRs themselves have, these are vessel trip reports for those who aren't into the nomenclature, um, have limitations, but they do give some sort of depiction in terms of how the areas are used. And this is one of the most difficult things, is trying to find some sort of objective measure of uh, the resource itself and where the activity is occurring. Sorry. This is VMS data. Um, these are track or transponders that are put on fishing vessels for various uh, federal licenses, but it measures traffic. It also measures patterns uh, in terms of some of the fishing activity. Uh, but again, access to this data and being able to interpret this becomes problematic sometimes uh, and uh, hampers our efforts in understanding what the patterns are. Just to show you, this is a very busy area. These are some of the maps that we generated for some of the marine spatial uses. This is the actual fishing activity itself uh, by gear types. And as you can see, the entire area is utilized. One of the interesting questions that came out as we were starting to depict these uh, uses is why not map the areas that are important to the fishermen? And we were given several reasons why the fishermen really didn't want to do that. I don't know what I did. Uh, here we go. One of the things that they did not want us to do is, is say that because the entire area was fished and there were temporal and other considerations, all the area really is considered important to the fishermen themselves. So uh, they don't want to get us into this uh, mindset where we're just looking at the important fishery areas and therefore the other areas which we didn't depict on the maps were really not important to them and we could go to town in those areas. The other issue is, is that obviously fishery populations are dynamic and they are on the move due to climate change. So they want a flexibility to deal with the dynamics within the population and those dynamics may dictate that certain areas are important this year but may not be important next year. And the markets are dynamic, so that um, the species that they may be prosecuting now may not be something that they want to go based on market considerations and whatnot. And last but not least, the regulations are constantly changing the game on them, so that all this comes into play. And this is why the fishermen did not want to depict what they considered to be key fishing areas on the maps. However, other uses we were able to go through and try to depict this uh, these are, for instance, recreational buoying uses. These are uh, distance racing, sailing courses. These are recreational cruise routes that are used for various places. And these are offshore uh, wildlife viewing areas for everything from birds, whales, to shark diving. The thing that I hope you're gathering from this is that while the ocean looks vast and unoccupied, it is a very busy area. There are a number of existing users that are out there, and that intensity is only going to increase, and hence why marine spatial planning could be useful. 
the thing that I should em emphasize here is that marine spatial planning sometimes gets confused with zoning. Zoning is another step you can take in the marine spatial planning exercise, but marine spatial planning is, is really trying to depict what the existing uses are, the existing resources, and helping decision makers make more rational decisions, not necessarily going to that last step in zoning, although there are many discussions that ongo uh, trying to take it to that last step to go to the, the zoning step. The other thing that we wanted to look at was what were the impacts uh, on the fishery resources and their habitats, and obviously there are a number of them that are out there and were discussed within the chapter. And then we eventually got to the policies and standards, uh, and these were looking at the fishery itself, the dynamic nature, and how could we try to uh, have a more meaningful process using the spatial planning exercise to, to make a more rational decision in this area. The major findings I don't think should be any surprise to anybody. Uh, we knew that the commercial fishery was important. We now can depict that within the chapter. Uh, we knew that there are certain species that are very important to us. Those are also discussed within the chapter. Uh, and the entire area is utilized by the fishery itself. So this concept that you're going to put new uses out there without imp impacting the fishery is a false one, uh, at least for the near shore which in Rhode Island's case is probably at least 40 miles offshore, uh, you will be impacting that fishery when you put anything offshore. Okay, so to get to the point, and I don't expect you to read all this, um, there will be a test on it, however, at the, at the end of class. Uh, uh, th what this is, is, is the, the concept of this is what we did put in place was this fisherman's advisory board. One of the things that was key to the fishermen was having input into some of these decisions early on in the process before things got too settled uh, and there was too much money invested for people to back off of them. So we've put in a pl place a pre-application process where there are fishermen that are appointed that have represented the ocean industry that will, um, an applicant has to meet with them as part of this process and we can bring uh, the fishermen in contact with those people and discuss citing decisions. And that's essentially what that says. This has also been modified um, at the request of Massachusetts. This is the one that was pre-adoption. The one that was adopted, adopted also recognizes that there should be three fishermen from Massachusetts that sit on this fisherman's advisory board. So we're capturing both states because there are areas that tend to border. And the other policies that are out there is that we shall prohibit any activity or uses that would result in significant long-term impacts to the commercial or recreational fishery, and the council shall require that potential adverse impacts be mitigated. So there are several policies that are put in place that recognize that the commercial fishery is there. We worked with the commercial fishermen to actually identify uh, sites that would pose the, the minimal impact to them. As I said, not that there won't be any impact, but the minimal impact. Uh, and then we tried to put policies in place that recognize that existing use and gave it some footing uh, on an equal basis with some of the other new uses that might particularly uh, come along or at, le at least try to protect their existence uh, in this realm. The other thing that we did is looking at this is we did also developed uh, policies that would protect the resource. And we did this through two other areas, areas of particular concern, areas designated for preservation. These, for instance, are marine areas. These are very important fishery areas. And we will not allow structures within these areas and protect them as a habitat. These are some of the navigational uses and other uses that exist that were also protected as areas of particular concern and uh, we seek to keep development out of these areas. And these are areas designated for preservation, uh, again, trying to keep offshore structures out of these areas for their value. Uh, and these are some of the major recreational areas that are also protected in the plan, and there are policies that are protecting uh, that particular use. So in the end, what is the value of MSP? I'm going to show you two slides that I think sort of sum it all up. This is our planning area again, and this was a project proposed by Grays Harbor. It was a offshore 
uh, wave energy project. And for those of you who are familiar with the technology, anchor chains all over the place, massive structures, uh, well over two to 300 that would be proposed in this area. Also, major commercial fishing area generated a lot of interest in our fishing industry relative to this proposal, got everybody geared up. Uh, the congressional offices were active, the governor's office was active, the fishermen were active, everybody was going to town on this project, and lo and behold, out came the sub lanes from Groton. This project was going nowhere, but well, the information wasn't out there for people to know, and certainly the developer would have never proposed this particular project had he known uh, that piece of information. That's the value of marine spatial planning. Thank you. So just to complete the baseball picture, <laughs> I'm from Baltimore, long standing and more recently suffering Orioles fan. So we generally know who we're playing. We also know recently that the results are not likely to be good, but wherever they are, if the Yankees lose, it's still a good day. <laughs> well, I'll stay away from Boston given the per current venue. Uh, so what a great panel. I think a uh, wonderful exchange of uh, perspectives, and I will try to round that out a little bit, uh, given my perspectives and the perspectives of NOAA as we uh, receive and begin implementing uh, national ocean policy and, and particularly the Ocean Council and the uh, marine coastal and marine spatial planning elements of that. Let me say at the outset, that I am a strong proponent of the national ocean policy and the national uh, approach and, uh, to implement regionally based coastal and marine spatial planning as what I think is an important uh, set of avenues to address some long-standing and, and also emerging issues of uh, the fishing community in particular and I think you saw that illustrated very um, uh, appropriately in Grover's presentation. Uh, let me also say, uh, by virtue of the fact that um, you might question my sincerity given my current post, that I came by that perspective uh, before arriving on the scene as uh, the admi Assistant Administrator for Fisheries at NOAA, in fact was heavily engaged uh, from the state of Maryland in the development of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Ocean Partnership uh, which was a collaboration of the governors in the Mid-Atlantic region which preceded really um, some of the detail of this ocean policy initiative primarily because the governors got together they saw some of these emerging uses they saw the need to address um, very directly uh, some uh, you know emerging um, spatial conflicts out there and, and saw the need for the creation of a venue to uh, help address some of those concerns so the National Ocean Policy, and I already mentioned uh, some of these, uh, includes a series of building blocks, if you will, one of those being the National Ocean Council, uh, the other being nine national priority objectives, and then finally this focus on a framework for coastal and marine spatial planning at the regional level. What I would say also to help you frame this a little bit is it includes in that context both a top-down oriented perspective, the National Ocean Council being primarily uh, an entity that will be represent, represented by uh, federal agencies uh, in a coordinating fashion, uh, but then also a heavy dependence on regionally based bottom-up planning as it relates to uh, coastal and, 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 and marine spatial challenges. Uh, I'm going to throw this uh, up here not to um, scare you but just to give you some perspective as to the National Ocean Council uh, element to this. And this is called for under the 
national ocean policy, and it basically asks the 27 different federal agencies that have some role with respect to uh, coastal and ocean resources to come together on a regular basis, work to coordinate activities, and attempt to do so in a fashion that delivers a better end result for these uh, coastal and ocean areas. And again, hearkening back to my perspective at the state level, uh, I would just simply say that um, there were t all too often with, that we, we were, found ourselves in venues working on, uh, for example, Chesapeake Bay restoration initiatives where we would have loved to have had uh, a more consistent and a more coordinated presence of some federal agencies that played potentially very important roles in achieving the kind of outcomes that we sought for um, Chesapeake Bay and some of our inshore coastal areas in Maryland. And I think that... Uh, uh, the, the prospect of the National Ocean Council to help deliver that more coordinated, uh, more focused work on behalf of these regional areas is uh, a potentially important outcome of this initiative. So there are nine priority objectives. Um, this is a, this slide in particular, let's see if I can get it all up here. Is a uh, NOAA-centric view of the world, uh, but it, it, on either side of this, uh, articulates I think the the nine priority objectives in a particularly uh, helpful way. You know, from within NOAA, in the center is uh, our strategic plan that focuses on some of the key areas of importance to us. Uh, but importantly, on either side are again those nine priority objectives. Uh, how we do business oriented activities like ecosystem based management, coastal and marine spatial planning and the like, and then areas of special emphasis going forward that you see articulated here uh, ranging from water quality and su sustainable practices on land and you know as you all know, there is so much dependence of many of our uh, important coastal and ocean fisheries species on what's happening inshore and upland, that if we're not taking care of business inshore and upland, we're not taking care of the future of these fishery resources in particular. So there is a, a, a particularly prescribed uh, task in the ocean policy that uh, these priority uh, objectives be addressed um, through some kind of a strategic initiative within six to twelve months of um, onset of the uh, of the planning process. Uh, th this slide I guess is a little bit late to this game but it, I think it articulates very clearly what we have already heard. Uh, there are a significantly uh, significant number and ever-growing uh, set of uses that are out there and if uh, we are not attending to them in a, on a spatial basis, they are going to proceed on their own uh, pathways. There are uh, something on the order of 140 different statutes, regulations, and policies that regulate human activities in our oceans, coasts, and Great Lakes at the federal level. Um, so that stuff is going to be happening. That stuff is going to be dictating outcomes, whether uh, we are trying to do it in a coordinated fashion or not. So some uh, moving more specifically to the coastal and marine spatial planning framework, uh, I just highlight a couple of uh, key elements. Uh, one of those is to bring, you know, sometimes uh, competing uses into one place for uh, at least some attempt at resolution. Uh, leveling the playing field specifically again gives, we think, the opportunity for uh, voices to be heard in places and in processes where they might not have traditionally heard or might frankly not have known even existed until it was too late. Uh, they are inherently data driven. One of the things I say to, uh, and, and you've seen a little bit of this already, but people in our community who are concerned about particularly um, fishery resources, ecological resources, that these regional initiatives are really starved in many places for good data. And so to the extent that we can provide the kind of data not only on uh, important habitats, on uh, the needs of uh, 
of, of fish resources and other biological resources that they depend on, but also on some of these historic uses to the extent that we can export that knowledge into a place where it is available um, for decisions that affect these communities, uh, communities that we care most deeply about, uh, we can only all be the better for it. And they are, of course, um, from a coastal and marine spatial planning perspective, uh, locally, uh, geographically driven. Obviously, the concerns in the Mid-Atlantic are not the same as the concerns in the Gulf or um, out on the West Coast or up in Alaska. Just a quick uh, uh, scan of uh, some of these coastal and marine spatial planning implementation areas. They actually line up fairly closely, although no, not exactly with our traditional focus on large marine ecosystems and the, and the particular, uh, particular regional needs associated with those uh, large marine ecosystems. I'm going to skip over this because it's a bit redundant. I'm going to skip over most of this other than to say from NOAA's particular role we see an important both in fisheries um, as well as through our National Ocean Service and other line offices within NOAA uh, a particularly important role for us to play in helping to provide the kind of data that I referenced a few moments ago uh, but also to provide the kind of technical support that might help uh, to ensure good positive outcomes for uh, for the issues and, and uh, concerns that, that we care most about. Um, there is a fiscal year 11 budget request, uh, still pending obviously, uh, for $20 million in grants to support the development of these regional ocean partnerships, essentially um, allow them, uh, help them build the kind of capacity that they need to, uh, to run the kind of data-driven data and consensus-driven process that uh, we talked about. Uh, there is a NOAA-specific website, cmsp.noaa.gov, uh, which provides a lot of very useful information on uh, what CMSP is and what NOAA's role is in supporting that effort. I did want to say a few words about um, the role specifically of fishery management councils. We've heard a lot about that already. Uh, obviously, if, um, if uh, you know, from a, from a fisheries-centric perspective, um, it would have been great to have the fishery management councils uh, identified explicitly as one of the authorities uh, to be included within the regional ocean partnerships. Um, the reality of it is that those regional ocean partnerships, um, the membership in those were defined through the National Ocean Policy to be specifically the federal agencies, the tribes, and the states with um, direct regulatory, regulatory authority over issues um, germane to coastal and ocean policy. Uh, we, we were successful, and I think importantly so, in having the fishery management councils being explicitly recognized in the national ocean policy as uh, an important entity to be consulted with. Uh, I'm sure that uh, particularly for um, some of my fellow panelists, that doesn't go far enough. Uh, but it also, from my perspective, presents an important opportunity for, again, from a ground-up perspective, the members of the Fishery Management Councils um, to reach out to uh, respective uh, regional entities, that some, many of which are already in, some op in operation in some capacity uh, independently uh, in, in at least all of the lower 48 states with coastal uh, areas. And so to the extent that the uh, fishery management councils can, f can now forge partnerships, can now create pathways to introduce <coughs> the data that we, that, that's important to us into that process, um, the, the fishery community will be ultimately all the better for it. So I'm going to have to delay for a minute here because I'm almost done. <laughs> that hasn't happened to you yet. <laughs> In addition to the NOAA website, there is also a National Ocean Council website, whitehouse.gov.oceans, uh, where you can uh, refer for the particular documents um, associated with ocean policy that um, have, been, uh, uh, have, have come forth as a result of this effort. And with that, I am finished and would be happy to uh, participate with my other panelists in uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.
what a great panel it was. Talk about a divergence of views. And uh, I think that uh, it's a great place to, uh, to wrap up the conference with the, the question that we have for this panel. Some have commented on this, but I'm going to start with the fellow who said, I'm just a plaintiff's lawyer. When you said that, I put my hand right in my wallet. <laughs> I, was, I got nervous immediately. A plaintiff's lawyer screwed up his baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> We did, we did see pretty, pretty much agreement on the Yankees suck issue, but... Uh, <laughs> no, not really. <clears throat> but uh, the question we have to answer, and it's, it's a, it's a one simple, one-sentence question, and I would encourage you to, uh, to think of this as a fairly uh, succinct response as well. And I'll start with you, Don. What's the best way to facilitate a productive relationship between fisheries and other ocean uses? From my perspective, and, and it is very limited because I'm not involved so much in policy, but from my perspective, what I notice from my clients is that the issue for them, and I'm talking about now fisher, fishermen, shrimp fishing, and, and right now the Gulf uh, insulin, is a, is a trust issue. It's a trust issue and it's a communication issue. And when you see how um, folks in the Gulf are responding to BP and how it's not only handling the crisis and the immediate and needs, but how they're dealing with the shared space. I think there's a lot of distrust and a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, expectation that they're not going to ever come together and they're not ever going to work together to, to uh, solve any of these problems. So I, I don't know how you bring those types of industries together, and I'm talking about the old energy sources. Uh, with the fisheries, but I can tell you that from, from my limited perspective, uh, nothing that comes out of the, uh, the energy side mm -hmm. is trusted by my clients as being anything that takes into consideration their needs, their concerns, and how they use uh, the waters. Okay, thanks. Don, Dan, uh, it seems that your, your answer to this question might have been, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, would, would that be a fair assessment? Well, uh, again, so I think I have to answer it on two different levels because first, as you know, as the individuals who invest in this company, um, yes, we're looking at trying to see if we can develop a business model um, that will allow us to invest in and um, prosper from a new industry. But to be clear, you know, not every fisherman is going to be able to invest economically in projects like ours, um, and therefore the, the the question you asked is more a broad question, and I think it's an appropriate question. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, up to now, for example, with the, the offshore wind industry, which is the next big user group that's coming down the line, I don't think there's been a, at all a serious discussion as to um, um, what will be the rules of the game in terms of how people can fish over cables and not fish over cables. And if people are, are prohibited, um, both um, from an economic point of view, what, what, how will that impact be? And so far, I don't think there's been, um, the fishing industry itself hasn't approached this because I don't believe they understand the scope. And when we talk about six turbines off Atlantic City, it's a demonstration project, but six turbines will not save, you know, you, you know, it will not solve any energy problems. And then you saw the same slide, you know, Grover quoted the same thing where the DOE is talking about 54 gigawatts of offshore wind, and then you're talking about 10,000 turbines, and no one has really grappled with that. So I think there is, uh, I mean, we're trying to, have that conversation ourselves. We're trying to generate that. Um, and I believe over time, the other companies that are proposing offshore wind will, will be brought to the table, um, either voluntarily or with pressure to have that same discussion. In reality, the last part about this is, you know, I, I don't think there's been a, a big enough discussion as to the public values as to, um, you know, as, as you weigh one versus the other, how do you judge or allow one versus the other? Um, as to which is a greater value or how do we balance them. And that scale has to be done. Thank you, Dan. David? I think there's a philosophical um, issue uh, in the way the administration structured uh, the, the, the process and, and who represents fishermen. In, in, in some sense, what you're hearing is that um, NIMS and the Fishery Management Councils will take the fisher, fishing industry's interests into account as they participate in, in, on one level in the marine spatial planning process. I know there'll be public input as well. Uh, I have a variety of clients around the country um, who have a variety of relationships with NIMFs and the Department of Commerce and the councils. 
Uh, some of them are, I mean, that would be an anathema to many of them. Um, some have better working relationships with, with NIMS and NOAA. Um, again, it, it, there, there's going to need to be a way of, I mean, it's the same, it's not a whole lot different in fisheries management. Uh, the, the, there's a, again, um, Don got it right. There's, there's a very fundamental distrust there. And I, I hope there's ways that, uh, that that can be bridged so that we can make good decisions about economic use, um, uses and priority fishing areas. Again, it, it's probably more the cabling and everything else that is going to cause the problem than the actual physical location of, of any one wind turbine, the Cape Wind being an exception. Thanks, Dave. Grover, you dealt with a couple of years of uncertainty and lack of trust in the ocean sand. How does that work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's uh, the interaction with the fishermen definitely is based on a trust issue. Um, uh, we had some baggage that we had to deal with because of some political pronouncements, and it looked like, you know, based on the pronouncements and schedules, that it was a done deal as to where these things were going, uh, and that caused some problems. And it took a while to build the trust level up to understand that that process wasn't a, a done deal. The, the other major issue I think out there is an acknowledgement that you have an existing use that's out there, it's, it's utilizing the area. You're going to find very few areas, if any, that aren't utilized by the fishery. And how do you um, mitigate, compensate, whatever you want uh, to deal with that existing use because there will be a displacement. Um, uh, even if you put a wind farm in and let's say the recreational fishery can get back in there, Let's say the fixed gear can get back in there. Uh, there's, there's still a potential displacement of areas, particularly for mobile gear and the operations. Nobody really knows uh, at this point to what degree it's going to impede the, the, uh, some of the other fisheries like the fixed, the, the fixed gear operations. So, um, uh, and there hasn't been a real serious discussion on compensation and mitigation. I mean, you know, there's not even an acknowledgement anywhere in the framework that it should occur. So, thank you, Glover. Eric, now you've actually got to put all this together as part so, of the team. Uh, yeah, I think probably I already answered from my perspective, but I do believe that these uh, regional planning bodies and as a as a venue to bring together data and expectations of a variety of different user groups are going to be. Uh, incredibly important. I think that there are a lot of decisions that are being made out there on a uh, on a single use basis right now that aren't fully incorporating the interests of uh, uh, you know the biological resources and the, and the fisheries and, uh, uh, and, and and coastal marine spatial planning holds some promise to uh, provide a reasonable uh, alternative to the current approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, time for questions, Susan. I know you're running a little late. Questions. We're a little late, um, but let's take a couple of questions for this panel, and then um, I'm going to offer a couple of options for the use of the rest of our afternoon. So. Very well. Questions? Morgan. I have a comment. Oh. First question, actually. Um, apropos of Mr. Um, uh presentation, I just want to note that in addition to the individual damage and the fisherman's damage, there's significant damage to the public public trust resources, and as a result, under that same Oil Pollution Act, um, NOAA and the Department of the Interior, and to a lesser extent, the Department of the Defense, as the federal trustees, and each of the five Gulf states as the state trustees for those public resources are engaged in a, a process that will eventually um, lead to compensation and a restoration plan. And restoration plan. So that's in addition to the individual damages and then just a small correction for what you said. When you said that people are going against BP and then BP goes against the other responsible parties, actually under the Oil Pollution Act, all of those parties are responsible parties. It may be as a matter of convenience that then people are going against BP that then goes after the others. But if BP went broke tomorrow, the other companies oh, are responsible are on the hook. So. And that's just the process. It's not the, the culpability the issue. They pick that's the primary. Uh, Well, can I make one little observation as well? Sure. One of the things that's most interesting about this voluntary fund of BP is that among the different claimants, BP can actually claim against itself its own 
disaster uh, costs its own. So BP is putting magnanimously this money into a pot that they can then go and collect back their own uh, cleanup uh, expenses. I'm sorry. I may have a little bit. That's very creative. <laughs> uh, Morgan? Just, just to rephrase that for the record, uh, what, <laughs> very quickly, uh, what, what, what can they, uh, how can the fishing industry uh, get involved, how can they be brought into this discussion in a, in a meaningful way so that we can move forward as a nation and for a common goal? I want to answer the question first, the way I was going to answer it. Have you ever sat, how many fishery management council meetings have you ever sat through? Several. So, torturous mm. and difficult and the, the result isn't always you know at the end of the day allowing fishermen to maintain a way of life in, in many instances especially as you see in ground fish um, I, that's as I said why I'm ragingly ambivalent um, I suspect that to, where there'll be processes and organized uh, groups, fishing groups with the resources to participate. They'll participate well, they'll participate aggressively. Um, I still don't think they're gonna, again, it, it's ultimately a defensive exercise for the fishermen. Um, I think the major element is not necessarily so much that somebody's gonna put a, again, Cape Wind in the issue of just sitting right on, on the shoals uh, excluded for a sec. I don't know that fishermen are saying we don't want to see a wind turbine out there. Uh, where they are concerned and where I'm frankly concerned is when a whole fishermen are beset by a whole bunch of different conservation groups and issues. It, it's I, I, hard to say that they're not. And to have that sort of imported into this process not as fisheries conservation related issues, but dressing it up as something else. Um, dressing it up, you know, we want to do ecosystem management through the fisheries, we're having a hard time, so we'll start to do it, you know, we'll create ecosystems around the, around the wind farms. And it's, it's what the fishery industry is going to have to participate one way or the other. Um, I'm just, what I'm trying to do is identify why it's going to be difficult to get them to fully buy in. And I know that's an unsatisfactory answer. I don't think that I can do any better because there's really, there isn't a good answer. So first I should tell a little story about um, 
one reason why I became active in terms of trying to be an agent for change rather than a victim of change. Um, about 10, 11 years ago, at the height of the internet boom, um, fiber optic cable companies, many of whom now are bankrupt and gone, Worldcom, uh, Global Crossing, all are proposing new um, fiber optic cables from the east coast of New Jersey to Europe or the Caribbean because they needed more bandwidth. And for about three years, I was the chairman of something called the Garden State Seafood Cable Committee, where we ended up spending, I spent a lot of my personal time uh, and money, and the industry's money, with lawyers, with the Army Corps, and with the state, trying to resolve a relationship in terms of how these would be installed, where they'd be installed, what the right was, what the, our rights were. In fact, one of the interesting things about this process was that, um, and, and, and so we were at a certain level, very successful because up until then, the fishing industry was for years plagued by AT&T saying you had to stay a half a mile away on either side of cables, and they were putting out cable charts. They don't give out those charts anymore because actually they were coercively forcing the fishing industry away from cables when they didn't have the legal right. You know, the law in the, in the 1800s was actually they had to stay half a mile away when there was a cable laying ship and a buoy out. It wasn't that you had to have, you had to stay away when after it was built. Because um, there's a presumption that someone who's building something is doing it safely you know, after it was built. Um, but basically, what viewed our interest was that, you know, I, all I could imagine these built structures, which now I'm a proposer of, I would be there for generations. And if we were to just fight for the status quo, we'd be basically in that action for the rest of our lives and our children's lives. And therefore, rather than, since this is a societal issue, and quite frankly, none of them will be built, including our project, unless society pays for it. Every rate payer in this room, and every rate payer on the East Coast, is going to end up paying as a decision because you're going to pay through it for your electric rates. It'll be a societal hedge. It'll be a bet. Maybe 20 years from now, it'll be a cheaper than what we're paying today, and it'll have been a good bet. But we won't know that bet until it's done, and we won't know that belt until it's built. The answer to your question is that, first thing, you know, I'll wear my other hat. The fishing industry has every right to not to be scared because it doesn't know the outcome. And, quite frankly, the, it hasn't been, been brought to them in a real realistic um, discussion as to, A, how will they be designed? Um, will you be able to fish over them? How will you be able to fish over them? And again, part of this is just not only, even if you're allowed to fish, because in our paradigm we're saying, yes, we're going to bury deep enough that you can fish over them, um, is that can you actually physically tow between things that are that close, close together and when there are that many of them? Um, so, I mean, you know, People are scared of change, especially when it's your only livelihood. And again, you, you're looking, so I, I don't think there's any question that people should be scared because they don't know what the future looks like. Um, so it's just, it's gonna be a dialogue and people will build confidence as they see the result of that dialogue. And if people are treated fairly as the dialogue goes, they'll be better partners. And if not, they'll just be more, um, you know, greater feelings of abuse. It's a question of how dialogue goes. Okay. So that's the I want to ask a question of Eric. Because, so, okay, so if we're all going to, if we've decided the best way to do this is through new ocean zoning panels, and they're going to be, you know, now they're going to be not combined with fisheries management, but they're going to be, you know, somehow parallel. You know, when will it be implemented? How will it happen? You know, you know who's being announced? And when will it go? Well, so first I would make the same clarification that I think Grover made, which is these aren't ocean zoning panels. These are they're basically planning it. Okay. Right? So uh, the, you know, actually the Ocean Council is meeting for the first time next week. Um, there will then ensue from that some process whereby they will, you know, invite these um, regional planning bodies to come forward. As I indicated, there are um, already in the lower 48 coastal areas um, some, there's some semblance of an intergovernmental um, cooperative already in, you know, NROC and Marco and I forget the one for the South Atlantic, the Gulf of Maine Alliance. So there will be some period during which those groups will decide whether they essentially want to be recognized formally as the regional ocean partnership. And then, and then in addition to that, whether they want to take on this coastal and marine spatial planning um, leadership responsibility. So it's going to be uh, you know, an iter iterative process of, that's going to play out over, you know, I think some, you know, some time to come. I, I don't, as I sit here, remember exactly what the, the sort of, the, uh, the, the mile posts are, but it's going to take a while. We have a lot more work to do, but we have run out of time for this panel. Thanks to this great panel for such an interesting afternoon.
we, we are running a little bit late, and I know a few people need to start leaving to catch planes and things like that. And I also know at this point, you know, Friday, when you take a break, not everybody always comes back. But uh, so I, 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 I want to do two things. Um, just to remind you all, you all have a bright yellow evaluation form. So if you don't fill it out and leave it with us before you go today, please take it with you and send us back. Um, in terms of resources down the road, uh, we will be putting the presentations up on our website. I'm also going to be compiling the great reports. Thank you to all my rapporteurs, Jackie, um, Nick, Christina, uh, Libby, and Meredith. Thank you all. Uh, it saved my brain and my, my hand tremendously. Um, so I'll be putting up some, some, some summary type of proceedings document up as well. There's also a really good background article, sort of Magnuson 101 on the website that you can access. Um, and whichever the presenters we can coerce, beg, or otherwise convince to submit an article for the law review, uh, that will be out probably in about a yearish time. I think it's going to be the late 2011, early 2012 one. So we will continue to try to be a re good resource for all of you. Before we go to the break, um, I know uh, Josh Eagle, Lois Schiffer, and Mike Conathan will all not be joining us because they've got to go get back to their places. So, and Eric as well. Um, if you all have any parting thoughts, as wrap up, I'll give you this opportunity before we all bolt. So, Eric, any, any other words of wisdom? We thought you were going to sort it all out. I mean. Probably said enough. Lois? It was a terrific conference. I thought very informative and everyone was respectful. And I actually like coming to conferences where people don't just bash out. So. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Mike? Uh, just briefly from the congressional perspective, um, I think maybe after sitting through these two days, you get a sense of you know, Congress has this reputation for not being a body that's very quick to act in any circumstances, but I think you can understand now why it took seven years to get the last reauthorization done. I, I think more discussions like this will, will move us in the direction of hopefully not needing another seven years to get the next reauthorization done, but, uh, but echoing Lois, Lois' comments, I mean, this is a, a tremendous opportunity to get some really good fishy minds in one room and, and try to sort out some of these issues that are going to be so integral to what we talk about in the next less than seven years. <laughs> you know, if we had another day, we could just give you the, the act as we all would like it. I mean, it would be done. It would be done. And we, could get, and we could give you the answer to you the whole... email address and you want to send it to me. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll be right on it as soon as I compile all the repertoire's reports. Um, Josh? Uh, yeah, it's actually, I'll use this opportunity to ask my question to the panel, or at least make a comment, which is um, a question of, and actually it's maybe an answer to Morgan's question about zoning and what um, the fishing industry might get out of it. I just tell a little story about the uh, Great Bear Rainforest, which is a big piece of public land in Western Canada, where essentially they had the equivalent of what we have here in the Northwest, a large dispute between timber industry and environmental groups over endangered species. And um, so basically endless litigation, contested forest sales, uh, both parties frustrated for more than a decade. And at the end of the day, the resolution was essentially a division of the land into a priority timber harvest area and a priority environmental conservation area where essentially the environmental restrictions or uh, the ability to challenge, for example, in citizen suits, uh, the restrictions were reduced in the timber area um, so that essentially what the industry gets is uh, less regulation, uh, greater freedom uh, to kind of choose their own regulation, uh, and then uh, the environmental community gets their uh, area as well. So one way to look at zoning is the question of if there are going to be disputes, it's are you going to resolve them uh, ahead of time through this kind of planning zoning process, or are you going to do it case by case as every project or issue comes up? Um, that's one of the ways to think about it. And you know, it's, uh, the big thing, you know, if you think initial allocation is bad in uh, IFQ's uh, initial allocation in zoning uh, is another uh, thing altogether. So that's my comment. Make one comment. Um, when we started out this process, there was a consultant hired by the state to go out and look at marine areas and propose wind farm locations. In addition, uh, each of the developers were offered an opportunity to propose wind farm locations as part of an RFP process. Ultimately, when we came out of the planning process, we didn't choose any of those sites, and it was primarily because of fishery <coughs> conflicts involved with all of them. Okay, and one, 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 oops, sorry. Might not gain out of this at the end. I'm just saying the question that you had asked is, how are you going to make, how are you going to make them trust it? It's a different issue. 
One last commercial plug. If you want to talk more about uh, the results of the, the legal legacy of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, we're doing another symposium because I just can't get enough of planning big events. Um, so April 13th and 14th, actually, uh, the tort lawyer is going to be helping us design that. We're going to be looking both at the mass tort implications as well as the natural resource damage um, implications of this um, around the one year anniversary. So stay tuned. We are going to break. I'm coming back, and if anybody wants to talk with me more, <laughs> we, we will. And if you don't, thank you for coming. <laughs>